Let me start off the panel by introducing Rick Wheeler, who is the moderator of the panel. Um, so Rick is a manager and architect for the file system team at Red Hat, and uh, he's done a lot of work in the recent past in the Linux file system and I.O. space. And prior to that, uh, Rick spent a, a good amount of time uh, working for EMC and uh, working on their Symmetrix and Centera product lines. And so, so he comes to us for, with a lot of experience in the storage area. And uh, I thank him for agreeing to moderate this panel, on, especially on short notice. Um, so I'll, ha I'll hand it over to Rick now. And, uh, um, and of course, I, I hope that the audience will help him out and participate in the discussion. Thank you. So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so again, I hope, uh, you know, especially after lunch, you know, everybody's digesting, sl slowly falling to sleep. So this panel will be a lot more fun if you all ask questions, especially mean, nasty, pr provocative questions. And we're going to start today by um, introducing our, letting our speakers introduce themselves and do kind of a five-minute opening thing. Um, then we'll come around with questions. I have some prepared questions. Um, but I'm happy to take questions from anybody at all at any time. Please do come to the mic in the center to ask and introduce yourself before the questions. So with that, Mohit, yeah. you're going to be first. Um, you can use this mic. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Is this live? Is that live? Go ahead. All right. My name is uh, Mohit Aram. I am the CTO and co-founder of uh, Nutanix. Can you hear us? Okay. Sorry. Um, my name is Mohit Aran. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Nutanix. I have a background in distributed systems, uh, been in the storage industry for nearly 10 years. Uh, one of the notable things that I've done in the past is I was the early team member in the GFS, Google, the Google file system team. And uh, I'm going to uh, go through some slides uh, which talk about what we're doing at Nutanix uh, for the last two years, a little more than two years. Let me stop this presentation. So Nutanix. Uh, is a company that tries to bring um, compute and storage together. And uh, I want to go back to this quote from the 90s. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, uh, this was what the storage industry was looking at. Basically, all everyone used to say it is faster to fetch data from across the network than it is to actually do it locally. And I'd argue that the whole storage industry is actually based on that one data. Uh, you know, there's a compute on one end, and there's a bunch of uh, centralized storage on the other end. And this is, whole tenant is based on that. But recent advances in uh, storage technology are really challenging that. Today, a single SSD can deliver more than 10 gigabits per second. And by the way, 10 gigabits is not even commodity today in networking. And if you just raid a bunch of SATA disks, those can deliver phenomenal bandwidths. Uh, a given SATA disk can deliver you know, about 140 megabytes per second. Read a bunch of them together, and you can challenge your commodity, commodity network. Think about what you can do by reading a bunch of SSDs together. We have all flash arrays today that can deliver phenomenal bandwidths. So the end result is that the network today is actually lagging behind storage speeds. So to deal with that, you can do one of two things. You can either go non-commodity networking, you know, by fiber channel or InfiniBand, which raises up your costs. Or you can do the other thing, which is bring storage close to compute. Uh, get rid of that networking in, in the middle. And that's what we've been trying to do at Nutanix. So Nutanix actually makes uh, an appliance consisting of a cluster of uh, high-end commodity nodes. And it's uh, distributed and incrementally scalable. And the storage lives inside the nodes, not outside. So you're getting rid of that all that expensive network. And so there's no need for a SAN or a NAS. We just completely get rid of that model. In fact, one of our logos is there's no SAN logo. We can actually build a distributed system with both compute and storage inside it without a SAN. And you might ask, well, what about all the nice things that storage uh, brings to you, all that separation of concern? You can do nice things in SANs and, and NASs, um, snapshots, backups, and all that. Well. If we can do the same thing here, um, and the sort of the separation of concern is actually provided by using virtualization. So in essence, your compute or your applications run inside VMs, and the storage software also runs inside VMs. And so they actually are not aware of each other in some sense, and gives you the same abstraction that you typically get with a SAN or a NAS. I have a, 
a sort of a flash animation next that demonstrates this. Um, so that's your traditional standard on us with storage sitting outside. What we've done is eliminated that, moved it inside, uh, inside the nodes, uh, and kind of connected it all together using what we call the SOX or Nutanix scale-out converged storage system. And it is actually incrementally scalable. You can just keep adding stuff to grow more, and it becomes a distributed system. And this is um, sort of convergence in the new era. Um, that's all I have to say about uh, myself and Nutanix. I'll pass it on to Rick. Yep, and I'm going to pass it on to Michael. Hello, I'm uh, Michael Cornwell. I'm a director of uh, technology and strategy for a company called Pure Storage. I think my background is uh, actually very long in the storage industry. I'm actually uh, second generation. As my, uh, my mother today still builds disk drive heads and she's been doing it for the last 35 years uh, for a local uh, Silicon Valley based uh, drive company. Uh, but beyond that, you know, I've, I've, I've really come at storage from more of a device level. You know, I started in the hard drive business and then uh, really some of the key notes of my career is uh, happened to be at the right place at the right time and uh, ran storage for the Apple uh, iPod and got to lead the transition there from uh, disk drive to flash. So really saw what the technology could do uh, in consumer applications. Um, from there, I went on to uh, Sun Microsystems, where I saw what the technology could do in the consumer space and really believed what the technology could do in the enterprise market. So uh, built uh, their first all flash array, as well as developed the first enterprise grade flash part in a partnership and co-development with Samsung. And also the flash architecture for uh, a lot of the Oracle systems like Exadata. Um, from there, it was really going to and finding a, a great startup team that was looking to solve the problem for Flash, which is how do you really develop a all Flash array is really not about sexy hardware like I did at Sun, but is really about how do you develop software that's capable of taking advantage of it. So I was fortunate enough to find uh, two founders of Pure, and uh, I get to develop uh, the hardware architecture for the, the platform. And Pure is building an all-flash array with no disks, no tiering, uh, with some very innovative features like uh, inline dedupe and compression. Uh, for me, the, the interesting aspect is how the, 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 the software is able to talk to Flash, which is because it's been rewritten from the ground up, it has no concepts of traditional disk schedulers. So what we're able to do through collaboration of hardware and software and, and some of our partners is really develop an I.O. scheduling layer that works best for the flash. Because inside of an SSD, you really have a file system. And so when you have a file system talking to a file system, there's a lot of issues that you end up having. And that's uh, something that we have done some very breakthrough things in, uh, in the technology. I think um, the areas of research and, and where I'm interested in questions is really about, um, you know, Today, the revolution is really in this blur between what is enterprise and what is non-enterprise storage, uh, both from a component level, but also from the standpoint of what a storage system is, what big data is, and how the, these technologies and these new breakthroughs have all been about getting around traditional storage in order to do the things that end users actually want. And I think that that's what's really happening today in the space. So I, I look forward to your questions about both flash hard drives, components, and uh, future directions. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Ed. Let me bring up your slide, Ed. Okay. Uh, so I'm uh, Ed Lee. I'm lead architect at Tintree. Uh, Tintree is a startup that's uh, building flash-based storage appliances, uh, specifically for virtualization. Yeah, the right side is cut off a bit. Yeah, hang on. I'll cheat. Is that any better? No. Okay. I'll keep talking. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's designed specifically for virtualization. It's not general purpose storage. You can only use it for uh, in virtual environments. And one of the things uh, that we've noticed is that oftentimes trends or you know disruptions in storage follow kind of trends or disruptions in computing. So, for example, uh, in the 1980s, we kind of switched from a 
a centralized model of computing to a more distributed or network model of computing. And as a result, storage kind of transitioned from a direct attached storage, say, to network attached storage. I think that today we're also in the middle of another transition. We're kind of transitioning from networked computing to what you might call a virtualized computing model. That is, more and more of the computing is being done in virtual environments and virtual machines. And we believe that, similarly, uh, this type of new computing model can benefit greatly from storage that's designed specifically for that. So what you might call, you know, virtualization-aware storage, or what we call VAS. Right. Uh, next slide. And if you kind of look at, and a lot of this stuff, of course, is driven by advances in kind of underlying semiconductor technology. And you see, you know, we've gone from like vacuum cubes to transistors to more and more integrated stuff. Uh, next slide. And what, has, what, and what that has meant is that uh, with each of these kind of transitions, it's enabled us to build kind of new, newer, better, you know, basically smaller, faster, denser types of devices, right? So, you know, you had these huge vacuum tube computers, then you had something based on transistors, uh, and then at some point something interesting happens. Instead of just becoming faster, smaller, denser, and there's nothing wrong with it, I love faster, smaller, denser, we need a lot of it. Uh, at some point, a dis discontinuity happens. The devices start to specialize, and you start getting like simpler, more intelligent devices as well. So for example, you know, uh, the mainframe, you could see it as a transistorized version of a vacuum tube-based computer. But then at some point, you start getting personal computers, which is a new form of computing. And then now today, you have mobile you know, and tablet-based computing as well. And these are disruptions that are created because the new technology allows you to build things that wasn't possible with the older technology. And I was just thinking the other day uh, how one might explain to a small child growing up today using iPads and so on how, what computing used to be. Like, there was a room in your house that had the computer. It had a desk, and there was a computer on top of it. And you, you positioned yourself in a chair in front of the desk so that you can access the keyboard to use the computer. How do you explain that to someone who's you know, just use, browsing the web on a couch uh, on their iPad? You know, iPad? I mean, those are the kind of fundamental huge changes that ha happen over time, right? Next slide. And similar type of thing is happening in storage. In, in the beginning, you know, the whole disk thing started with the IBM RAMEC drives, which had this huge magnetic, it was literally this big. A small child could fit through the hole in the middle of one of these disks, right? And a storage system consisted of stacking like 40, 60 of them in a pad, and that was the storage system, right? And, and then you, ca you came out with smaller drives, the five and a quarter inch, three and a half inch drives, and then RAID technology, right? RAID software technology, which allowed you to aggregate all of that into the modular storage systems that are common today. Well, that, those, those hard disks are now being replaced by SSDs or augmented by SSDs. <coughs> and now the big question is, what will the new form of storage look like that utilize these devices? Is it just faster, denser? Is it just new packaging? or are new types of storage systems going to evolve as a result of this? Next slide. So just to give pause for thought, you know, uh, fundamentally I think that an SSD is more than just a faster hard disk. I mean, it's, it's like 400 times faster than a hard disk. Uh, and certainly in terms of IOPS, it's pretty close in terms of latency. And the speed of sound is only 250 times faster than walking. Right, but if you could go to work at the speed of sound, you know, you would be pretty happy, right? So, <laughs> this is like a huge fundamental shift. Like, uh, you know, I've been trying to work out more regularly this year. Uh, you know, <laughs> working on a treadmill, and you know, I'm in the gym working on a treadmill. And the funny thing about a treadmill is you're walking, but you're not going anywhere, right? So when you get off the treadmill, it seems like you're walking at supersonic speed. It's like it seems like you're walking so fast you're afraid of accidentally bumping into things. So. That's kind of the qualitative feel you get when you switch from hard disk to SSDs. And more than that, SSDs really eliminate a fundamental, you know, key mechanical barrier to scaling. Of, you know, computers, they're all electronic, solid state, everything. Disk drives have a hard, you know, moving piece. That's the one piece in the system that doesn't scale with semiconductor technology. Now you've eliminated that. Now that you can scale all of that, 
what's going to happen. Uh, next slide. So really, uh, I think we need to view SSDs kind of as a new fundamental building block. And you know, as you get new types of building blocks, you do more than just build bigger, faster versions of what you had before. Like, you know, when you got I-beams, you could have built larger cottages, you know, but, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, uh, but you could also build things that you couldn't build before. So that's kind of the, you know, question. And uh, next slide. And I think what you can build with SSD, one of the things you can build, it's not the only thing, I think there will be many types of successful products based on SSDs, but one thing you can do with SSD is build simpler, more intelligent systems that work better. Because with a hard disk, anytime you try to build something simple and intelligent, you're adding a layer of indirection, you're adding another level of disk lookup. You just went from one random aisle to two random aisles, you just killed your performance. Okay, that idea is not going to work. Okay, with SSDs, it kind of frees, frees us from that. You can add more layers of indirection, build more sophisticated systems. And really, the key to, well, one, one of the keys to all of this, I think, is to focus on the application. Because when you try to build simple intelligent systems, it helps to pick an application area to make it simpler and more intelligent. It's hard to build a completely general purpose system uh, you know, that is fundamentally better than you know, the existing general purpose system. So really being able to focus on the application and making it really easy to visualize how the system works and to provide appropriate control mechanisms for controlling the system. Next slide. And one of the problems we have today is that each of the self-systems we have, like servers, networks, and storage, is fairly well optimized. Uh, they have good control mechanisms, good ways to monitor them, but you put them all together into a system and they interact with each other in unpredictable ways, especially if you put them into a virtualized environment because with virtualization, uh, you know, you're, you're running multiple applications on a single server, everything gets abstract, virtualized, you lose all kinds of information throughout the system. So being able to control all of that top down becomes very difficult. So in order to restore that uh, kind of visualization and control, I think you need to focus on the virtualized application and design systems specifically for virtualization. Next slide. So, so basically, you know, these are some of the key challenges uh, we see at Tentry is to be able to visualize kind of the complete system end to end. And visualize means being able to collect and analyze the information in a form that is easily understandable, right? And being able to provide intuitive and effective controls uh, for the system. And so traditionally hard tasks that have been difficult to do there are things like bottleneck identification, you know, quality of service that is actually effective and easy to use, and being able to visualize what the impact of you know, turning knobs or doing things is on the actual total kind of high-level application behavior. Right. And I think this may be then, okay, just one more. So intelligent systems, uh, in order to be intelligent, I think it helps to be aware of the target applications you're addressing. More than that, the systems need to be able to interact with the environment in which they're operating it. They can't just take care of their, themselves as just a single system. They're part of a larger system. In order to work well in that larger system, you have to understand what that larger system is. And you know, I'm wondering you know, if in the future how all of these intelligent systems are going to coordinate. Uh, are they going to hold meetings? Uh, is my refrigerator going to have to coordinate with my stove to decide what to cook for dinner? So those are all... I think that is, you know, that is, that's an important question as well. You've got an intelligent storage system, you've got an intelligent virtualization infrastructure, you've got intelligent servers. You know, what is the way, best way in which they can all leverage each other? So, thank you. So let me bring up um, the next slide. Um, yeah, I know. Okay, so um, Nisha from uh, Fusion.io. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Nisha Talagala. I'm an architect for software at Fusion.io. So in listening to Ed speak, I was reminded, very recently I, my three-year-old daughter came and told me that her iPod touch needed recharging. And this was just disturbing on so many levels. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but going to more of, um, you know, kind of the server kind of and enterprise usages of Flash, which is one of the things that we do at Fusion, uh, what I'd like to give you guys is a kind of a, a view of some of the, you know, kind of interpretations that we've had of some of the uh, trends that actually people have been discussing kind of all day today with them. So what do people do with Flash? You know, why do we think it's a block device? And so on and so forth. So um, next slide. 
So, so, so the world of kind of flash deployment in the enterprise basically started as kind of a disk drive, and it went, you know, so I've been working with flash now for quite a few years, and my first experience was it when it was two companies ago when I tried to build a cache out of it. And at the time, I met with every single flash vendor out there, you know, deconstructed their products, figured out how it worked, and created a, you know, a cache that would exploit that in some form or another. And basically, you know, at the time, basically, the people who deployed Flash were mostly either folks who really wanted to innovate or folks who had a, such a large problem that it couldn't be solved any other way. And now we're starting to, you know, get to a point where the, the extreme kind of edge of the, of the innovative folks who deployed Flash deployed it a number of years ago as a disk drive, learned how it worked, and now the mainstream adoption is just kind of starting to begin which means that those folks that were initially kind of, uh, you know, at the front edge with Flash are now, you know, realizing that you don't get everything out of it when you think it's just a disk drive. And you really need to, you know, see it as something more natural to what it is to sort of get the next level of, you know, uh, of innovation kind of out of it. And so the first thing that kind of happened with Flash is, um, and this is one of the things that Fusion IO drove, is to, you know, realize that you don't necessarily need SATA or SAS kind of protocols and you can communicate with it directly as a PCIe device. Next slide. So, oh, these slides are looking really... Yeah. yeah, and they're still getting chopped. Okay, uh, can I go back one more slide? Yeah, yeah hang on. So, yeah, so, so the next thing that basically happened is that, right? is that people started realizing that you needed to tier, you know, non-volatile memories and traditional disk drives, and you started seeing the emergence of cache software. And so what's on the slide right now on the second column is a, a particular version of that software that's you know, provided by Fusion IO called Direct Cache, which basically provides you know, transparent tiering, still maintaining the block model but allowing you know, hard disks to basically be transparently accelerated. So still the block model. What we're, you know, so one of the things that we announced very recently is something called the Software Developer Kit, which is fundamentally taking the first step of moving beyond the block model and allowing applications to interact you know, much more natively with Flash through a, very, a series of custom APIs. And the first range of those custom APIs are still I.O. oriented in that there's a notion of a request, there's a notion of a response, but the requests themselves aren't you know, block reads or writes. They you know, allow you to you know, see sort of the log structured nature of Flash in some cases, you know, allow you to you know interact with the garbage collection. You know, specify you know importance of data versus other things, and so on and so forth. And basically, what you see on in that third column there is that stack, which is something that uh, we announced about two months ago. And it has several different elements. At the lowest level, it recognizes that file systems that build upon block devices do a whole bunch of work that then the SSD underneath goes ahead and does again. You know, sometimes cooperatively, sometimes in conflict. And so, the, so at the very lowest level, it provides kind of a, a native file services layer that lives directly on top of the flash management and presents itself as a file system. Upon that, there are custom APIs that can be used for various classes of applications. Some are targeted at databases and fo focus on the transactional properties inherent within, you know, a flash translation layer, some focus on, you know, it's, uh, I elements that are, you know, useful to NoSQL stores, and then others specifically focus on caches, you know, very similar to some of the cache concepts that Omesh described this morning. So those are some of, they're still I.O. oriented, but they are essentially allow you to interact much more um, um, directly with the, some of the complexities inherent in things like non-volatile memory management. Uh, next slide. Maybe one more. Difficult. Um, there you go. So what comes kind of after that is, you know, why, you know, thinking about these things not just as I.O. devices, but inherently as memory devices. So there are applications that want to, you know, like to program to memory. And, you know, Flash inherently is really um, too slow for direct load store access, but there are some... Um, you know, media coming out that have a lot more potential in this particular area. And so, um, so some of the technologies that we're developing have to do with, 
you know, even in the presence of flash, sometimes flash complemented by other kinds of media, it's possible to offer a series of memory semantics. And when you think about memory, you know, you can think about it as volatile memory, as persistent memory, or something in the middle, which is sometimes volatile and sometimes persistent. And so, and basically, and what you're seeing on the slide there is that, you know, there's a series of, you know, ways that you can think about, you know, flash as a volatile extension of memory, possibly even interacting still underneath with the same media. And at the other extreme, you can see, you know, this entire entity as direct load store persistent memory, where it actually not just presents itself that way at the application, but actually takes those paths, you know, directly into the device. And so these are some of the sort of the, the technologies that we're developing that are, you know, kind of targeted towards sort of helping applications, you know, sort of take that next step in, in using non-volatile memory in a, in a kind of a much more native fashion to sort of to the point that you made, you know, kind of simplify application design, you know, quite considerably. That's all that I have. All right. So, uh... Okay. Drag this over as well. Yeah, next slide. <laughs> so what do you get for updating to Fedora 17 okay. the day before the conference? Okay, so as uh, Rick is bringing up the slide, uh, my name is Kaladar. I'm part of the uh, CTO office, Advanced Technology Group at NetApp. Uh, just a plug-in for NetApp. We are hiring, so <laughs> any grad students here? <laughs> Uh, please see a NetApp employee. And um, so the other thing is, so Umesh, that was a great talk today. And uh, by the way, all the design points you mentioned, NetApp just announced a product called Flash Pools, which follows your design, <laughs> design points. So I think we're doing something right there. OK. Um, so when I was asked to sit on this panel, I, I looked at the world as uh, three, three different things. And a confluence of these three different things is actually dictating the key trends that are in the, in the rectangle in the middle. So let me quickly go over what these three different buckets are and what, they're, what they mean. So the trends. So as you all have been hearing about Flash, uh, and uh, as Umesh pointed out, there are a couple of other technologies that are in the pipeline, like phase change memory and spin torque memory. Phase change memory can be a better Flash. It will not have the speeds of uh, uh, you know, DRAM, but uh, you know, it will be better than flash. And similarly, spin torque memory will actually compete with DRAM. So you can imagine, uh, uh, you know, non-volatile memory at DRAM speeds. So that will change your design center, exactly how you would design operating system, uh, storage system, et cetera. The whole design center will change. But I, I believe they are still a few years away from being, uh, you know, at the scale at which we can buy flash today. And as already mentioned, you can have flash on host. You can have flash um, in uh, what we call as pure flash arrays, which were built from day one with flash in mind, not with disks in mind. And you have hybrid arrays, which use both disks and flash together. And the second key trend, which I think is uh, very interesting, is uh, scale-out architectures. So how many of you actually use Dropbox or have heard of Dropbox? Raise your hands. OK. So you know the back end of Dropbox, right? Amazon S3. So the Google file system initial paper came, I think, in 2003 or two. I can't remember. But that whole notion of paradigm of architecture is becoming dominant for what we call as capacity layer. So storage world is getting divided into IOPS layer, which is things at flash, at host, uh, you know, pure flash arrays, et cetera, where they're being optimized for IOPS. And then the capacity where you have architectures like uh, Amazon S3, uh, you know, Google FS, and you know, m many other architectures like you know, ClusterFS, et cetera. So there, the optimization design center is to optimize for capacity. And the last key trend is server virtualization. Server virtualization is changing the ball game in many ways. Uh, with respect to uh, server virtualization, um, one of the key things is it allows you to co-locate and move computation to where storage is. Uh, so for example, now you can actually run uh, applications on storage boxes, right? So for certain types of apps, it makes a lot of sense to filter data at, as close to the storage as possible, right? 
And as Mohit pointed out, they're packaging servers, I mean, compute and storage together, right, at where the data is getting uh, near the app. So that is another way you can co-locate them. So server virtualization is changing the ball game. Uh, with respect to looking at storage architectures, before you go ahead and design storage architectures, you have to look at the app. What are the characteristics of apps that you're trying to design the storage box for? And one of the things I'm noticing that we're not really touching upon here is streaming type of data. More and more workloads will be streaming in nature, like video, you know, audio streams, you know, conversations, etc. So the design center and design patterns for streaming data is not quite what we have been discussing here. So I think exactly from your iPhone or iPod, how the data goes through CDNs and edge caches and how it goes to the storage device, and exactly you know, how you design for that is different. Another key point, the granularity of management is changing. In the past, we would manage things at file level or volume level. Now things are changing. People are managing things at VM level or, you know, or app level, right? Different apps are different constructs. So the granularity of management, how you think about that is important. Consistency models. More and more of these large-scale apps do not want strong consistency. Uh, they want, for some data, they want strong consistency. For a lot of other types of data, they don't want strong consistency. They want eventual consistency. So you can leverage that in your design. And storage access. So in addition to NFS, SIFS, iSCSI, you know, like block storage, what are the new access models? And one interesting thing is that app, as an app writer, I don't, I want to worry about hash tables. I want to worry about B trees or other data structures I care about. I want scalable, persistent data structures. I don't want to be mapping those data structures to files or to SQL databases and so on. So ideally, we need to provide that level of abstraction to the apps. And then the middleware should take care of the mapping of those data structures to the underlying storage systems. Metadata management. So a lot of times, there are, there are, I would say there are two types of metadata. There is complex relationships which you need to store in a relational database. And there are simple key value type of metadata, which ideally you don't want to store it in a separate database. You want to store it along with your storage system and retrieve data or objects from the storage system using this metadata. Last thing there, uh, new business models. So clouds, you know, they're changing the ball game. So essentially, a lot of the medium and small businesses are storing their data in clouds, right? So and for large companies like EMC, NetApp, et cetera, they're decoupling their hardware and software so that you can buy their software and run it on commodity hardware. So that's another key business decision that's happening. And the last thing is companies like Cloudera, Red Hat, they're getting commodity boxes, software running on those commodity boxes, and they're going to support them. So that's another business model trend that's happening. So a confluence of all of these things, basically I've identified four major trends that we need to, as a group, as a research community, worry about. First, management is moving more into the app or hypervisor layer. So what does that mean? We need to think about the different types of apps that are being written, how exactly is the app builder actually programming? What do they want? We need to understand that better so that we can build the right systems for them. Second, IOPS is definitely moving closer to the applications, closer to the host. So as a community, we need to figure out, as Nisha pointed out, what are the right abstractions? I don't think block level interface is the right interface. So what are the right abstractions as IOPS are getting closer to the host to access these new class, classes of memory? Capacity layer is definitely going to the scale-out type architectures, right? What are exactly the problems and challenges in these scale-out architectures? If you're managing these devices, right, uh, Google and Amazon probably have 100 PhDs to run their uh, clusters, but I don't think many other companies can have the same model. So they need systems where they're well-managed and simple to manage for large-scale clusters. And last thing is co-location of storage and apps. So I think in some cases it makes sense to have data close to the app, in some cases, it makes sense to have the app closer to the storage. So I think both models we need to support. So I'm done. Thank you. All right. So this is the time where you all get to think of brilliant questions and come up and, and stump the panelists. But uh, anyone want to start with a question? Come up to Mike. Perfect uh, from Google. So. I wonder if the applications are ready to take a, a good advantage of the, some of the storage technology trends that we have been seeing. Like, if you have been designing your applications right, you are 
used to the storage being slow, right? And uh, now you put flash in there, and all of a sudden your storage is going faster. So uh, I wonder if you guys are familiar with or aware of uh, things that are happening in the application space where we are changing things to take advantage of the higher IOPS that we, are, we have actually available. And uh, if you guys have any thoughts about that. Any, any volunteers to take that? Yeah, like with respect to a database, right, when you do the logging, you usually try to aggregate your logs and write them in a sequential way because fundamentally you assume that the disks are not good for random, right? Yeah. So that, that model has to change in the context of uh, storage class memories. Yeah, so that's what I think I, I kind of worry about, that you know, the things in the application space are not changing as fast as uh, technology is changing, right? So you will see a space where your appliance or whatever can offer more than what the uh, applications can make use of. Yeah. Right. And there, there are also new classes of applications like VDI, for example. Uh, pull, the mic, pull the mic down and grab yeah. the mic. Yeah. Where that's an application that just wasn't feasible until you had Flash. Like many people tried to do large VDI deployments and because of the poor kind of user experience, you know, they weren't able to do it. So, so some applications I think are being designed uh, are being enabled directly by Flash. Yeah, I think, I think we've observed similar things as well. So emerging applications are obviously kind of naturally, you know, adapting much more because they're not constrained by, you know, say dec a decade of legacy code that may have been optimized for disk drives. And so um, within, you know, things that are much more traditional applications, uh, p I mean, people are starting to, you, you know, you see, it's like, say, newer releases of database software, for example, typically starting out with using something like Flash as a cache. But some of the more foundational changes, such as, you know, the way you think about threads, the way, you know, you think about kind of parallelism, logging, and transactions, those take time, and those are harder for, you know, for particularly for established applications to make use of. One interesting fact we've observed is that sometimes if you put a Flash device underneath an app, you can, you know, we've had situations where you can expose, you know, race conditions in the app that were always there. It's just that they were never triggered before, you know, under the timing that, you know, traditional storage devices provided. So I think we've seen a lot of application change. Um, you know, the emerging applications adapt very, very quickly, but even some of the more established apps are, you know, over the space of the last three or four years, you know, Watching a database, a major, inter, you know, established database change in, in three years is actually very fast for for, for that you know class of application. You know, I, I got to see this really firsthand uh, you know, at my time at Sun, right before the transition to Oracle, and trying to do a world record TPC benchmark on Flash, and learning all of the things and ways that Flash just didn't work with their database, and took nine months to rewrite major portions in order to make Flash work in a, a, a low latency way. With, with the database transaction engine. So I think, you know, there's more of that that needs to happen. And the question I really give back to you is, how do you, how do you educate the community on all the ills in their software when they go and block while they wait for an I.O. that they didn't need to block for? And that's, that's really the, the, where I think the application community is not educated today on how to, to optimize applications for Flash. But to me, the interesting question is actually, um, I can actually flip the question around and say that uh, I can flip the question around and say actually the fact that we have all these new storage devices uh, and these new storage trends makes new applications possible, applications that weren't even possible earlier, right? So now rather than worrying about maintaining complicated indexes and worrying about disk seek latencies and stuff, you can just have a, a simple index. I keep it in an SSD, load it from there. VDI is a very good example that Ed talked about. That's a trend. I mean, VDI is all about random I.O. There's a lot of random I.O. In, in VDI. That is something, if you just had shared disks, you would, VDI would not be possible because there's so much random I.O. Uh, you know, it's going to hit and seek latencies and stuff. Uh, and so there are these new trends that are coming up and which making a new class of applications possible. And when these new class of applications are actually written, um, like Nisha said, um, it's going to be written with these new trends in mind. So it's re less relevant what the old application guys are doing, and whether they're changing their applications to meet the new storage guy. Yeah, that's happening. It's going to lag a little bit, but also think about the new applications that are coming up. I, I'm going to be, before I take the next question, I'm just going to say I'm, I'm going to challenge the lag a little bit and say it might be like 20 years before you get rid of the last vestiges of POSIX semantics lurking down somewhere in system libraries, <laughs> right? So I, I do think there's a huge challenge, right? I mean, as we move right. to new object model, you know, like S3 semantics aren't POSIX compatible. They're not coherent, 
how long is it going to take to, to adapt the software ecosystem and how do we help them get there? So the question is, are, are the POSIX semantics even relevant? I mean, think, think about it. POSIX is basically a rudimentary index put on top of a storage system. Um, and that index basically exists because it's not, it was not possible to look up uh, or have a very efficient index. With new kind of storage systems like SSDs, you could have a far more complicated index. And you can see this in uh, devices like, you know, in applications like Dropbox and stuff. You, you know, operating systems are doing things above the file system to put uh, an index on top of the file system that you have. So POSIX might remain in, in some way, but is it uh, going to be as important to the applications as it was before? I don't think so. I, 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 I guess more my challenging is I clearly see that POSIX isn't relevant in a lot of new spaces. I don't think application programmers even know in the system libraries how many POSIX assumptions there are, and those people who wrote those libraries might have retired 10 years ago. Right, so you, you find if anybody support customers, um, <laughs> you, you find these annoying customers who try your product and find these lurking dependencies they, they don't, aren't even aware of. I, I think that's going to take a long time to get through. Yeah. yeah. I mean, on the other hand, it just takes uh, one developer a weekend and he can tune his application that used to just generate 1,000 IOPS to do uh, 100,000 IOPS. And yeah. you, you could do that with existing interfaces. You get a few of those applications, and you know, that'll really ramp up. It's a, it's a motivator for people to write some of those greenfield applications or recode. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Next question. Uh, hi, um, I'm Young Su Jung, uh, coming from the Penn State. And actually, I, it, uh, your talk is very impressive because I'm uh, not the expert uh, on a high-level view of file systems or something application. And uh, all you guys are talking about Flash in a high-level view, right? So you're going to manage the, some, the flash laid or some flash storage using new interface like a nameless. But I'm really curious that as time goes by, you have to change or replace SSD because it, uh, such SSD guys, the SSD will uh, wear out. So the, every SSD have a different formats and different mapping algorithms and different garbage collection strategies and parallels and something like that. So I'm really curious, in a high level view, do you have any the, some algorithms or some IO scheduler to expect what happened in an in, in SSD so that you can efficiently manage the SSD array or some, some something like that? So in, in our software stack, one of the things that we realized is that every SSD, every generation is going to change for the next seven to ten years. And to date, we've seen every single generation of SSD completely change their architecture. Some have, you know, more hard drive buffer manager type architecture. Some are designed around complete randomization for, for page access. And so what we've done is we've added a, a flash personality layer into our software stack that virtualizes mm -hmm. the SSD. And then we, we basically have a custom scheduler for every single one of those SSDs that we get based mm -hmm. off of the architecture. And really, that's, it's, it's a difficult way to solve the problem. But until the SSD community standardizes on hardware, like you have with disks today, for example, a hard disk drive, typically within a generation, you have plus or minus 10% from each of the vendors you could buy a disk drive from. You don't have that today with SSD. So until you get that as a commodity, you're going to have to live in a world where you're going to have to do custom optimization for every given SSD that you end up trying to develop with. I have a different take on this. Um, so SSD lives, uh, not all, but some SSDs definitely, the life is so much like if you use an SSD in your laptop, you're probably going to change your laptop sooner than the SSD will actually wear out. So the consumer grade SSDs are already getting there. In, in enterprise, uh, you know, behind the scenes, SSDs can actually tell you how much they've been written and if they're getting near to kind of getting weird out. And behind the scenes, you know, someone in that bin can actually go and change that without uh, affecting availability. So, you know, uh, people are just working around the problem mm. uh, without actually affecting availability. That's what's happening. Again. But, okay. uh, you know, as, as technology improves, these uh, wear levels and times will only go up. The age will only go up. So it's not a real problem. So okay. You get your SSD in, in, a, in a, Mac, a Mac of Air, right? It's probably going to last you a couple of years, but you're probably going to change your laptop before that. Okay, okay. Thanks. Yeah, so just to maybe add to that, I mean, uh, even before you sort of go across manufacturers, you know, basically the underlying NAND technologies, you mm -hmm. know, change with every generation. Mm -hmm. And this is, aside from the fact that there are two kinds, right? Mm -hmm. 
So first of all, there are two kinds, and they're very different between SLC and MLC. Mm -hmm. But even if you look at just MLC, with every generation of MLC, because it is driven so much by the consumer market and not by the enterprise market, even if it's 5% or 15%, it doesn't really matter. It's still the consumer market that has the majority. So what happens is that different vendors' ability to convert that consumer-grade MLC into an enterprise-grade product is not the same. Mm -hmm. And there's a massive difference between the people who know how to do it well and the people who don't know how to do it well. And that's going to be represented in the end product. Uh -huh. And so that's just always the case. And, you know, however, you know, um, across devices, there are some fundamental things like the nature of wear out, the nature of garbage collection, the uh -huh. fact that those things have to occur. And so, um, so one of the, you know, areas that, the reasons why we focus on things like APIs is that there are some generic ways that applications and flash devices can interact with respond with the, from the point of view of resource management and so forth. Okay. You know, every a flash device will do it a little differently, but the engagement model, the API you can speak to, uh -huh. you know, notifications of various events, ability to control events and so forth, can be generalized. Okay, okay. So, yeah, so as Michael said, every SSD has its peculiarities, and like Nisha said, uh, but there's also some commonalities in terms of standard techniques you can use. One of the things I would really like to see is uh, maybe SSD devices designed more for storage vendors, so to work better with like log structure file systems, those kind of approaches. Yeah, okay. Huh. okay. Yeah, I would second that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Get rid of those reserves. We don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Fred Douglas, EMC. Um, so we heard a little bit in uh, the last, uh, you know, uh, the answer is the last question really about consumer devices. Um, you know, so we were talking a little bit about what it means to have flash in, let's say, a laptop or, or phones or things like that and what the implications are there. And we've heard nothing about the implications for other, in other respects such as um, power consumption both in terms of mobile devices and also um, large-scale data centers and for green computing and such. And so I'm wondering if you can uh, go expand beyond just performance, which is really what the big focus has been all day, and talk about some of these other issues. Are, are you assuming power consumption will go down, Fred? I'm hoping. <laughs> well, what I'm asking about there is, I mean, people when people talk about green computing and they want to have the, foot, the energy footprint of a data center decrease, what are the implications as you move from spinning disks to flash uh, you know, is, are there other benefits besides the performance benefits that you've been talking about here? But so far, pretty much all we've been hearing about is performance. Yeah. So, so uh, if, if we have a chance to fill a whole cabinet with Fusion I.O. cards, pack it densely, will we save power over rotating storage? You know, I don't have the numbers off yeah. the top of my head, but generally, I mean, I think many of our customer cases that we deal with, power savings, it comes into the comes picture, in. yeah. yeah. You know, it, it, it depends on the specific scenario, and I don't recall any numbers, but generally it's true. So the, fa the fact that you don't have a spinning disk, you don't have a, a mechanical part, and the fact that you have one component rather than, you know, reading together six different set of disks, in itself uh, saves, you, um, right. saves you power. But I also want to say that uh, there are some new technologies coming up. HP is coming up with these uh, nano stores uh, based on memory stores, uh, which, I mean, their essential tenet is that most of, most of the energy is actually spent by pulling data from storage uh, or pulling it from memory, computing on them, and then writing it back. And they're coming up with this memory store technology where the data kind of just, you, know, you can actually push computation close to where the data, data sits, which is in the memory store. So these kind of new technologies, I think the, it's, uh, the first one is going to come out, I think, uh, 2013, and they're actually going to challenge uh, uh, DRAM speeds in 2014. That's what they're saying right now. And these will really become in, very interesting in trying to lower the power, power consumption of uh, I'm going to just dispel the myth because um, SSDs use more power than hard disk drives. And uh, today what's happening with a lot of modern SSDs is that they, they are so fast that they're blowing the thermal budget of either the PCI slot or the hard disk slot in the front. Um, you know, a two and a half inch drive, small form factor drive slot is designed for nine watts. There are SSDs that you can stick in that today, fully active that use 18 watts. So what happens is that you have to, you know, the nice thing about an SSD is that you can actually throttle, you know, it's basically a linear, linear graph. The amount of performance that you want is the amount of power consumption that you'll use. Uh, the difference there is that you have these peaks of power. I mean, the, the analogy I always use is like a Prius, that 
the, when the SSD is, is active, it uses, especially when it's writing, it uses a lot of power. But as soon as you're not writing, it uses very little power. And so what you see is over you know, a, a, a large distribution of time that an SSD will use, in fact, less power than a disk drive because you're not accessing it at 100% duty. If you were accessing it at 100% duty, 100% write duty, it would use more power than its given slot competitor with, a, with an HDD. So maybe I think just one thing to kind of add to that is that you know, so uh, one of the, I think, the uh, you know, reasons why people find it difficult, for example, to evaluate flash is that it is a medium that, you know, is, you know, higher performance and more expensive than disk. And then there are so many different dimensions. So generally, like, for example, I mean, uh, what we find is that people who are looking at not IOPS, not watts, not dollars, but something like IOP per dollar per watt. Right, which is really what you're trying to accomplish is it's not that you need more IOPS, it's that you need the same number of IOPS cheaper or you need more IOPS for the same amount of you know, TCO. That's usually when it comes in because that device that you plug in that consumes more you know, power in the slot is also doing 10 times as many IOPS. Yeah, so while, a, while an SSD might take more power than a single server disk, you know, you're giving the performance of maybe six or seven different server disks. And exactly. Is it taking more power than that? I don't think Next Hi. question. Uh, Michael Condit, NetApp. Uh, so you guys have talked almost exclusively about uh, Flash with the exception of Kaladar, but this is supposed to be a research panel, so I'm going to ask you to look ahead to faster forms of storage class memory that are on the way. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in the question of making such storage reliable, reliable. At least one of you has talked about the obvious fact that the faster the storage is, the closer you want it to the compute server. So let's assume the storage is going to be the persistent storage is going to be on the compute server. That's the primary copy of it, but you need to make it reliable and highly available. So you, you need to get it to another node. How will you do that without slowing it down? It, it's, uh, it's got a latency of, say, 20 to 50 nanoseconds. What network are you going to use to copy it to another node? So, uh, so this is really a very good question, and I think this is one of those, you know, kind of things that, you know, kind of is at the crux of these new memories. So, for example, I mean, you know, dual porting one of the memories is, you know, is one way that you can get, you know, access by two different nodes without necessarily creating a replication. But this is sort of the interesting question, which is, so you have these persistent memories. They access at hundreds of nanoseconds. Now, they're sitting in my server node, which is not where I want my persistent data to live. You know, it's probably not where my backups reside, my audits reside, and all this other stuff, right? And so, so this is, I think, where, you know, you get a lot less excited very quickly about persistent memory if you can't find a way to replicate it. And so I think, you know, so at a very base level, you know, transferring it over any network that exists today is going to, you know, increase its latency if you do it synchronously. And so I think we'll, you know, start thinking about a world of different things that start maybe with something as simple as dual port and then end up with just thinking fundamentally differently about how you think about the replication, you know, and the way that you think about the persistence of data. It's a great question. Well, I would just like to also point out that some people have told me, well, networks will get faster too, but there's this, this unfortunate limit to the speed of light. Yeah, yeah. And then I think that remains to be seen. I think in general, you know, the, the impact of, 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 things like flash memories on the networking architecture of a data center is an interesting question in its own right because when you have all these machines now with their own local flash or you've got a, a SAN device with a whole bunch of flash on it, it changes the way your network has to be thought about. Well, I, and I think... I, I was just going to follow up on that. I mean, so why not move the comp compute to the data, right? I mean, if the compute or the job you're, you're running is smaller than your data... Exactly. Migration, virtualization makes that a little bit easier. Exactly. Well, I, I think you have, just, just to follow up with this, is I, I think you even have a, a, a bigger problem, which is as you start to look at the storage hierarchy, as DRAMs start to become faster, they want to start getting closer to the CPU as well. So I think you end up growing this gap between what's outside the box and what's inside the box because, you know, the DRAM is going to be living in a chip stack, likely, with the processor. We'll, we'll have a finite amount of what's called fast DRAM. And then you'll start to see more of a system class non-volatile memory that ends up living in the system. So you'll see like, you know, gigabytes of data uh, DRAM that's close to the CPU, and then you'll end up having, you know, up to a terabyte of non-volatile memory that's living close to the processor, and then that's when you'll end up going out of the system in order to 
have those, those slower latencies that you have today. So I want to address the problem in a different way. You know, can we think of applications a little bit differently? Can we weaken the semantics, the fact that they can expect from storage? When I do a transaction, when I change my bank account, can I expect my storage to be a little bit more lenient? Can I, can I, is, it, is it okay to me to kind of take money out of my bank account, put it in another bank account, and then find that it's, the transaction actually didn't happen? And if we can do that, then uh, you know, if, it, if we change the semantics at that level, then we can hide these latencies, uh, we can absorb these latencies, and, and, and uh, you know, so it's a very interesting topic for research on how the application visible APIs for file systems need to change to kind of um, find it acceptable for these uh, latencies where you uh, are, are transferring the data across nodes. So that's an interesting topic for research. Ajay Gulati, VMware. I would like to nudge the discussion a little bit on the storage management side. So there are a lot of some basic questions that I sometimes get asked from the customers. For example, somebody might come in and say, I want a certain amount of IOPS, certain amount of space, and let's assume some percentage of working set. Now we need to configure the system for that requirement. And earlier it used to be that you take the IOPS and you figure out how many spindles you need for that many IOPS and you try to sell that kind of box to the customer. But now we have more knobs in there. A related question about capacity planning, where somebody says, I'm running 100 workloads on my box and now I want to admit two more to the box. Can you make sure that if I admit two more, the performance is not going to crash and all the existing 100 ones are not going to suffer? So some of these issues, do you think, are they getting any easier with SSDs? And if they are, um, are you thinking about those in your solutions to make the life of the admin easier who has performance, but there are a lot of other things that he needs to deal with? I mean, I think it's, with SSDs, it's a lot easier to provide a certain base level of performance, but that ultimately it will actually make the problem worse because it will allow people to build a much more denser storage systems. So instead of running 100 workloads on a single storage system, you'll be running 10,000 workloads. And, yeah. I think that pushes the envelope a little further. Yeah. So now the performance problem would come, or this particular problem would come another few hundred workloads later. But we all know you give more performance to the programmers, they would write even relaxed exactly. applications. They would do 10 times right. more IOs on you. They'll right. say it's so, so cheap, let in, me just do in it. In the short term, it makes it better because you replace your hard disk based system with flash, and your, your storage performance problems disappear. But then your applications, the developers rewrite their applications to use all the IOPS. And now the problem is worse because you've got higher IOPS and you've got a lot more workloads running on it. So I think, uh, you know, and, and I think a big challenge here is how do you provide uh, a good level of visualization and feedback to the user? Because the system cannot automatically allocate all resources, right? Because it doesn't have enough information to do that. So you need to provide the user an opportunity to tune and control what it's doing. But how do you provide information in a way that the user can understand it and can, you know, tune the right kind of knobs? So a certain amount of default performance isolation certainly helps uh, handle maybe like 80% of the cases, but you also need to provide intelligent ways for users to control and understand the system. So I, I would say I think the storage also needs to become a little bit more smart. I mean, think about a dump sand where, uh, you know, uh, if you are using virtualization, uh, any request that comes from a VM, it, it can't dump. Uh, you know, for, for, for it all requests are the same. So if you introduce those two extra requests, it doesn't know whether, whether it's coming from user A or user B. Mm -hmm. If you can tag that, if you change the storage protocol, tag that request, right. then it can make more intelligent decisions. Yes. Then it can admit those two or not admit those two based on quality of service. Right. Of course, so some of that has to be tagging is just the beginning, though. You have to actually implement the but, mechanisms as well. So even if we start tagging them, would the storage system be smart enough to tell that how much more performance or host power le is left in the device? Right. And now you have controls over the space in SSD, you have controls over the space in disk, and you are doing all the scheduling on top of these devices. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and it's in, in its industry standard today, it's just, you know, software like VMware has to enable the tagging to let storage systems like ours know. So is tagging the about. only thing stopping this thing from <laughs> happening? <laughs> what, what, is, what is already being done in many systems is uh, not so much in terms of IOPS, because so far in Ceratus, it was very hard to predict what kind of workload it is, right? You can't predict it's going to take 10 milliseconds to do my work or a few uh, microseconds. But what, what has been done, uh, we even did it in the Google Cloud system, which is that if the request comes to the disk, you can actually um, kind of reserve capacity. Okay, this amount of time, user A will be kind of given, this ratio of the disk's bandwidth will be given to user A. Now, if that user ends up using the bandwidth incorrectly by sending a lot of random requests, that's his problem. Hmm. So in that sense, that has already happened. 
and a lot of storage vendors, I believe, are already doing that. But to actually precisely predict in terms of IOPS, I would say that has become better with SSDs, given that there's not a wide fluctuation. Uh, but I think there's still some distance to go. It's definitely not as bad as in, in this. Yeah, there, there is work in the Linux kernel, at least, to do containerization. And there's, I know Vivek and others have worked on, you know, IOPS, I mean, both bandwidth throttling and containerization and IOP throttling. So I think that's actually a big thing, is you increase the pool of IOPS, it's still finite at whatever rate it is, so you still have to be able to carve up with your, with your thousand guests or whatever, and, and allocate and proportionally control. I think it's actually a huge, hugely interesting area. I see. And can we also expect at least the degradation to be more smoother? Because in disk, once you put few workloads, you can actually get five x drop in performance. In SSD, if I add one more, I should not expect five x drop for everybody else. I think that depends on how the storage system is designed. <laughs> Probably depends what True. you do to the SSD. Yeah, it's, uh, it's depending <laughs> yeah. on the use. Yeah, if you put uh, proper layers of quality of service on top, you can prevent that degradation from other guys. Uh, now, if you are the principal, you are the resource principal in some sense, and you cannot send a flood of requests, you can expect all your requests to be served at the sort of the same same uh, uh, SLA level. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Just one more thing to add to that. So, at capacity planning time, uh, I think for different types of workloads. In the past, people would say this goes to fiber channel, this goes to SATA, et cetera. So in, in the flash world, it's more, you can do more co-location of different types of workloads. But still, so far, what we have observed is that most admins try to keep their different types of workloads in, on different pools so that they don't interfere uh, because they don't trust the... <laughs> I mean, given the lack of controls, they have no option. That's right. <laughs> right. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Richard Elling with Day Storage Systems. Um, it's taken us a very long time, a lot longer than the technology actually, to, to have our customers stop trying to design systems for bandwidth and design for something more related to their performance constraints. Today we talk a lot about IOPS, and IOPS this and IOPS that, and it's a very easy metric for people to understand. If the IOPS goes up and to the right on the graph, it's good, just like your stock market, right? Um, but from performance, that's not really the problem we have. We have a latency problem. So how do we change the industry from talking about IOPS to what really matters for performance, which is latency? I think that is kind of, auto of automatically happening with SSDs. Uh, with disks, really, it was the IOPS that determined the latency in some sense because you, you end, start getting queuing and then the, your latencies go out of control. But with Flash, you have a better opportunity, I think, to provide at least some basic uniform level of latency even at you know, very high IOPS. So I think that is happening over time. So it's starting to become sort of a, a, a larger factor in, for example, competitiveness and so forth, because if you get to a point where everybody can achieve the same level of IOPS, you know, and, and particularly the IOPS level is high and to the, the discussion earlier, you know, when you compare things with the disk drive, everything looks good. You don't have to do much of anything, but then applications become more demanding as they should because there's more to offer and, you know, and people are starting to compare based on things like jitter, you know, is a, you know, and performance variability and whether the line stays flat or does this and things like that. What I think would help, you know, a lot in kind of trying, you know, sort of standardizing some of that is if there was actually a metric to speak about the predictability of workloads. Because right now, predictability, everyone measures it a little differently depending on their particular scenario. And so, you know, is it 99 percentile latency? Is it something else? Is it standard deviation? But if there was actually, IOPS is easy to comprehend. It needs to be kind of quite that easy to speak about predictability. IOPS and latency are very two diff very different things. Often get, the two get confused. You can have a very high number of IOPS and yet very bad latencies. And the latencies basically come because of the queuing delays and stuff. So if you send a lot of requests, the system will still give you a high number of IOPS, but there's a lot of queuing, and so you get a high latency. And so you get into the realm of uh, sort of real-time systems where essentially you almost guarantee latencies. And in order to do that, if there is a huge flood of requests, you've got to drop some. Not all applications actually care about that. Um, they're like, okay, no matter how long you take, just serve the request, right? So, um, you know, it's, the realm is interesting more according to the application. If there's an application that really wants that, then it's interesting. But, you know, I think those applications, at least to my knowledge, are more in a niche than, uh, you know, I think more, most of the applications are just happy if you give them a lot of IOPS, no matter what the latency is. And that's where the world stands today. Oh, I, I think it's really, this is a, a problem, a marketing problem. 
which is that the SSD community went out and talked to all their customers, the Dells and the HPs of the world, and I apologize if any of you are in the room, and said, well, what do you want? And they said, oh, I want a 5,000 or I want a 20,000 IOP SSD, and they didn't specify latency. And so what happened is they met these metrics, but then all of a sudden had eight second timeouts on, you know, max outlier when they're doing garbage collection. And the press didn't solve this problem either because they went to the SSD manufacturer and said, oh, well, tell us how fast this thing is. Oh, it's 50,000 IOPS. Yet they didn't talk about any latency. So what happened is your customers and first generation SSD customers all got burned by these max outlier latencies that were breaking applications or breaking windows because it had like 10 second timeouts and they were extending past it. And so what needs to happen as a community is coming up with a way to specify it, whether it's 99% latency, whether it's maximum latency. By the way, all SSD manufacturers have this data and if they tell you they don't, they're lying to you because I've seen it, I've requested it, and I get it as I evaluate SSDs. So it's really educating the community on what really matters and, and as a, a community stop talking about IOPS and start talking about latency. Thank you. Uh, Brandon Salmon, Tindry. Um, so you guys, I think every person on the panel talked about some changes in abstractions. You know, we've, we have current block storage, we have SSDs that are packaged like disks, and that makes me extremely happy. But um, I've been somewhat burned in this before. My thesis work was in semantic file systems, which have been around for however many years, and yet we still have POSIX, and you know, files and folders are still the way we think about things, right? So I think there has to be a compelling reason for people to adopt new tech, new uh, interfaces. So my question is, what, what are examples of scenarios where you guys believe the current interfaces are enough, insufficient enough that people are actually going to reach out for new types of interfaces, wherever that be across the stack? You, you mean NFS at 30 isn't young and spry anymore? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think yeah. I'll jump in on this one first because of, you know, we've been talking about a lot about Flash, and uh, up until recently I was, a, you know, a board of director of the trade association for the disk drive industry. The disk drive industry has this fundamental problem of 512-byte LBAs and what it does to disk drive interfaces, what it does to complexities of the disk drive, as well as they have all these great new recording techniques where they're going to overlap your data and no longer be able to write it in a, a random way. So they've struggled for the last 10 years trying to move off this 512-byte LBA standard, and then they're still struggling trying to figure out, okay, how do we do collections of data so that we can actually start to move data and maybe put a file system on a disk drive in order to make it work. And the problem is, is legacy software is killing it. And so at some point, a large OEM or somebody like, you know, Google, who, who here is and hopefully listens to this, needs to, to support one of these new m methods like object storage or and or some of the OS hints where you still have an LBA architecture, but it's a collection of LBAs. This is what's going to be required, and all of these interfaces work with Flash just as powerfully as they work with disk. And it's, it's a fundamental change that needs to happen, and unfortunately, the industry just doesn't have a leader that's standing up and saying, this is the direction that we all need to go. Yeah, so I think some of the uh, kind of the observations that we've made is, you know, people have gotten a lot of value, like you're thinking about SSDs, people have gotten a lot of value using SSDs just with the block interface. So there's, you know, it's not, you know, there's no need to pan that. There, you know, people have, you know, gotten, you know, done a lot of great work in the last, you know, ten, five years just using that. Now, what we are observing for particularly some of the new interfaces that we're developing is that basically, you know, people particularly who have already established that, you know, baseline with the blog are fundamentally it's about an increase in efficiency, you know, and to basically, and, and also sometimes coupled by an, uh, a desire to actually get more predictability because what happens is that if there's a sophisticated, you know, piece of code underneath that look, you know, is trying to look like a block device, fundamentally you've lost a level of control. <laughs> over what it's going to do. And if you care about that predictability, then sooner or later you're going to reach into that. So it's usually one of those two things. I think so far what's happened is uh, people are working around projects. So for instance, um, you know, stuff that really should be part of the file system is put outside the file system. If you want to have an index that indexes your file system, operating system will do it outside the file system. If you want to have weak connectivity, for instance, if you have Dropbox or Box or something like that, you know, you use POSIX semantics to write to your local file system, but then behind the scenes, it's going to be in a disconnected way, right, to um, the background. So I think uh, POSIX semantics can be get around, but it's 
putting additional onus on the application or operating systems to do the work that really belongs in the file system. I, I personally feel it should go into the file system, but is there a, a real pain point for that to happen right away? I, you know, it's, it's, that's up for debate. Hi, uh, I'm Prem Singh from VMware. Uh, I have a, a question that, this, so the topic of, uh, of this was, what, what is the next storage? Is it uh, gonna be an evolution or a revolution? And we focused more about, is it gonna be disk or is it gonna be flash or mix of both and in that sense. Uh, I have a different kind of question that is, uh, uh, I understand that there are some uh, companies here uh, that are do developing appliance-based storage, whereas there are some companies that have uh, their own proprietary hardware where they are uh, developing the storage from. Uh, especially looking at the cloud uh, storage where you want to have flexibility of uh, like changing the storage or like having more flex flexibility of changing the storage underneath or having uh, using different types of systems. Uh, is there a shift in using traditional, uh, using appliance storage as compared to tra uh, tra uh, proprietary hardware? And if there is, uh, what is the challenges of using appliance-based storage? And can the appliance, storage appliance in a virtualized environment be able to uh, give that uh, amount of uh, re uh, performance and uh, uh, guarantees uh, that a traditional physical storage can give. If I understand the correction correctly, uh, question correctly, comparing disks versus appliances. No, like or, so. You using more commodity hardware versus uh, using VMs and do, doing this sto the server part of the storage as a as a VM than a. Uh, I mean, ultimately, all the appliances are doing is they're wrapping a layer of software on top of hardware. Right? And by doing that, they can provide some enterprise features. They can provide snapshots. They can provide backups. They can provide maybe quality of service. And that's the value add. Uh, but the, I, you know, they can actually deliver performance that is pretty close to what the native hardware can do. Um, so I don't see that's a problem in terms of performance. I mean, they're actually, the reason they sell is because they add a lot of value on top. Are you asking that the management is being done by hypervisors? Yeah, yeah, hi yeah, so in, in are, are you running, can you run in a hypervisor uh, your appliance than having your own? You mean uh, mainly a software component? Yeah. So, so I think, I think uh, maybe since, since I do this for a living, and we actually, I mean, so Red Hat does a virtual software appliance and a standalone ISO image. So you, you can absolutely do that, right? I mean, the trick is understanding how robust the I.O. path is through the hypervisor down to the bare metal underneath you, right? But it's just bits, right? You can run anything you can run in a VM if you have certainty that the data integrity path and what you need as a storage appliance is, is robust, you can do that in, in a virtual machine image. And it's great. I mean, you can put it out in the cloud or on a hypervisor and move it around. So yeah. both the, both this, uh, yeah, both the uh, concepts seem to work in the... Uh, yeah, I would say one, one key thing is that when you, like we run our stuff also in a hypervisor and we have a solution. Only thing is support. Uh, when you have like an appliance or like one throat to choke, it's easier for support standpoint. Otherwise, if you're running on any commodity hardware, yeah. usually you certify a hardware. Otherwise, who do you go and choke <laughs> if you have a problem? Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, the, an important point today is that uh, I guess custom hardware in the storage business is pretty much dead. You know, with the serverization of storage from, from Intel and how all of the pieces have been commoditized and Finiband's been commoditized, Fiber Channel's been commoditized, you know, we all pretty much use the same boxes from the one or three different vendors that just give us a nice hardware solution and that we can build our software on top of. And so that's, I think, a key key direction change um, in the industry, which is this, this commoditization has led the focus be not on hardware, but more on hardware software integration and or just software. Yeah, so yeah, in particular, um, fewer people are using, say, custom hardware components, but uh, there have been some things that have been pre 
uh, preventing people from just using software-based solutions. Like, for example, most storage systems today need some form of non-volatile write-back cache to be efficient. And it also takes actually a quite a bit of uh, physical work in order to select and integrate the drives in a way they're hot pluggable and all of that. So, uh, and then furthermore, to run the storage software, you need a certain amount of memory versus CPU and various operating system modifications depending on you know, what you've chosen. So it's hard to do all of that just in a purely software system. Also, um, in, in, uh, in my slides at the beginning, I talked about um, hypervisor at Nutanix. We actually can on the storage requests come to the hypervisor. The hypervisor kind of sends it to, those, uh, to a special VM which runs the storage stack and that then writes to so, so we actually don't have this uh, appliance model. We don't need an, an external appliance. That's why we say this no SAN or no NAS uh, and logo. So that, that push is already happening. Yeah, but, but one, one interesting thing is that the whole model of HA, uh, DR, right, and, and basically different types of failures. Previously, historically, people were more handling it in, like, I would call the hardware slash lower level layers. Now the distributed software makes multiple copies and handles that. So yeah, that is. But, yeah, that would even help perform better than the. It, it, it has trade offs, yes, but yeah. yeah. It can be used, those copies could be used for load balancing purposes, yeah. But, but still, the, if you go to petabyte scales, if you're making five or six copies, there's okay. a cost, okay. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Atish Katpal from NetApp. So uh, I was basically wondering, we've been talking about SCMs and uh, disks. Uh, we just got reminded about uh, one of the very old friends, Tape. And I was wondering that uh, with, uh, you know, we, someone talked about green technology, right? So tape is definitely much more uh, cheaper and at the same time more power efficient and you don't need to keep it spinning. That's one of the things. And the other thing being that in the IOPS layer, so Kaladar was speaking about IOPS and capacity layers, right? So we're seeing that flash is, uh, is virtually re totally replaced now, uh, disks at the IOPS layer. You want more and more flash up there. And once some of the reliability kind of concerns and replication-related concerns are solved for Flash, you might see a complete uh, Flash-based IOPS tier. And in the capacity layer then, uh, from a cost point of view and also from green technology point of view, would we now be moving towards replacing disks with pure tapes if, if you could have uh, you know, reliable Flash storage and then that backed up with tapes? Uh, would we be basically seeing that disks are going to go out of the equation completely? What do you think about that? <clears throat> I think the storage is basically now it's not just one type of storage. Storage consists of tiers. Right. So there is SSDs on one end, um, there is disk in the middle, in SANS, SANS or even cloud, and then there is tape. Depending on your application's use case, you can move your data around. And you know the challenge is in building intelligent you know, storage stacks so that they can do this transparently. So I think there's a place for everything. If your data is cold, you can actually put it on tape. And that, yeah, will take less that is power. something that is happening today, but I was wondering that disks replace tape uh, because of the IOPS requirements, right, for these applications. But now disks are being replaced by flash for IOPS requirements. So no, why do you need this? I don't think it's, I mean, I, I'll go back earlier. I mean, it's not just IOPS, it's latency, right? So the latency, latency. with the tape is really big. Yeah, right? that's true. That, that's different, right? It's not just an IOPS. Yeah. It's like you've got to go find some guy yeah. who has to go mount the tape or poke the robot button and go back to the salt cave. I think it depends on the application. Uh, you could also make yeah. the argument that disk is replacing tape, like in backup, for example. So yeah. it really depends on the application and what kinds of maximum latencies you can tolerate and what's the total size of your database of, you know, and how quickly it has to be made online and so on. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and to the point that Rick made, I mean, some of this is also about sort of the management cost, right? Mm -hmm. So if you take the dollar per gigabyte of a disk versus the tape, you get one number, you add the tape robot and whatever the disk, you know, management is, you get another number and then how long, how many admins you have to keep, you know, pay to keep the whole thing up, you know, keep your data alive is a third number. And interesting enough, sort of independent of flash, I think there has been a, a movement for disk to at least replace tape in some arenas, but not, by, by no means all. And so sure. it's hard to imagine that any of these would go away. Sure. Yeah, I'll just throw out one last thing about tape versus disk. I mean, in my mind at least, and maybe this is just a bias from having done this as a system, system man like 30 years ago, but writing to tape is really easy. Getting your data back from tape was much less predictable. <laughs> so, you know, you, I, I don't know if, I, I assume today's tape technologies are much more reliable, but still, you know, people back up to tape as kind of a last case, last hope recovery mechanism. But with disk, you actually do assume that it's going to be there, even if the latencies aren't as, as big as flash. 
right? So I think there's a, a mind, you know, a mentality around it as well. Yeah, just to add to what uh, Mohit said, so essentially I think uh, we need SLO or service level objectives to describe application capabilities. And based on that, we need to be able to figure out exactly how to move data between all these different layers. And, and people definitely do not want ILM type of solutions because mm -hmm. they don't want to be specifying which data needs to go where. Mm -hmm. So the system management software, both in the IO path as well as control path, needs to know, okay, I need to move this to maybe cloud or I need or, you know, S3 or I need to move it to disk from flash or from disk to tape and so on. So I think that's a hot, it's going to be a hot research area, in my opinion, in the next few years. Sure. Thank you. So actually, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's probably good for research, but I think it's also been done a lot of, I think uh, companies are kind of uh, merging SSDs and disks and transparently moving data between the two. Even we do it at Nutanix. When your data is hot, it uh -huh. sits in the SSD, when it gets cold, moves, moves to disk. Okay. You can attach other tiers like the cloud, perhaps even tape, although mm -hmm. probably you don't want to do that. But, but, Technically, you, you can do the same thing. We, we've had HSM software for quite a number of years. It works pretty good with moving data from disk to tape. Uh -huh. Does it just move it back again? Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's it's a challenge. Moving it back up so the challenge. The, the, yeah. to do it transparently. The application should know that its data has been moved. Uh, when it, it, it's always accessible to the applications. Mm -hmm. Application makes a read, it comes back. Uh, that's the trick. Sure. Thank you. Hi, uh, Yun Mao from AT&T. So AT&T is a networking company, um, so I'm also more familiar with networking. So there's a sort of an initiative called Software Defined Networking. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but uh, you know, the idea was that the switches used to be really simple. You know, they're dumb and they do one thing really good, is forwarding packet really fast, but network starts to get more and more complicated. They add more and more control logic on top of it, so things get really complicated. So software-defined networking says, well, instead, maybe you know, we want to provide open APIs and use software to you know, make a more flexible, more manageable control plane on top of this entire networking stack and let the you know, hardware switch do what they do best, which is forwarding packet really fast. So now, Go back to the storage community. You know, the disk used to be, you know, a device that store bits that's really reliable or fast. But now, as I see in the SSD, you know, there's lots of control logic add, add on top of it, and especially, you know, the log structure storage and the garbage collections and maybe different ways of tagging things to quality of service. So I guess my question is, do you see in a couple of years perhaps there's a maybe an initiative, maybe software defined the storage where vendors may open up APIs and to let software do more intelligent and control layer on top of that? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely happening a lot, especially in the virtualization arena, right, where VMware, for example, is defining lots of additional APIs to push more information down into the system as well as to get more information about the underlying store system up in order to make the overall system more intelligent. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done, though, in terms of what is most, what is the basic functionality that's most efficiently done at the storage system, and what kinds of information should be passed down, and how how do these components need to cooperate with each other? Yeah, I don't know a single storage vendor that wouldn't love that, um, whether it's the guy who builds the SSD or guys who build storage systems or even you know further up the cl the, the chain. Uh, it's just really we 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 have to somehow augment or get rid of this block interface that we all have to live with today. And if we did have those hints, the, the type of storage that we could make would be absolutely amazing. I think we should probably have one more question. Okay. Um, Yael Melman from EMC. Um, actually, everything that I heard here looks to me um, evolutionary. It seems that what governs today the data needs, the new data needs are <coughs> applications that are used by Google, Facebook, lots of data that has to be processed in parallel, fits the cloud, fits a lot of... Uh, uh, is there, do you know of anything really revolutionary? Is there any application that somebody cooks? And maybe the question is not to the panel because you are all existing companies who need to show some revenue in the very few, <laughs> near future, but there are a lot of uh, PhDs and PhD students here that may be working on things of the future, you, things I'm thinking about, you know. How, how do we store 
data in our memory. It's not zero and ones. It's completely different mechanism. Is anybody researching it? Can we use biological <coughs> molecules, entities, to store more data? Not zero, one, SSD, you know, thousand IOPS, latency. <laughs> I, Although is, that sounds kind of anything, evolutionary too. But. No, <laughs> even just looking at the programs that deal with biological data, you know, the genome, huge amount of data, the cancer research. It's different than applications I've heard here, but is there anything that is done in this area that anybody know about? You know, there is something real revolutionary that will change things. And you know, in particular, what I'm personally interested, not, not in the company, not EMC, is how do we store data in our memory, in our brains? <laughs> and uh, is it something that can be exploited and be used for future, for real revolution? Well, I, I think, you know, that's, uh, I, I'm clearly not qualified to answer that question, I'll, I'll first say. I think the thing that we didn't, well, the thing that we didn't talk about on this panel as much was these new memory technologies. And, you know, whenever I get approached about a new memory technology, my first question is, uh, do you have a billion dollars? And when someone asks, well, why do you, have, why do you need a billion dollars? Well, to productize a new form of memory, you need at least a billion dollars. And, you know, I've been designing products around phase change memory for the last seven years. Seven years I've been trying to build a product based off phase change memory, and it's not, it's not available yet in a productizable form. And I think that that's really the challenge is, yes, it is an evolutionary thing because of the amount of money that it takes to drive innovation in this business. Luckily, you know, there is, a, you know, a tens of billion dollar TAM, and there's customers or competitors like EMC that we're all chasing to try to get a piece of that TAM. But I, I think to develop these technologies in this breakthrough way costs a lot of money today. And that's the thing that's preventing things that, that are, are, will take us to that next step. Right. I mean, there, there have right. definitely been very interesting ways to store data. Uh, I mean, you must have heard of HVDs, holographic uh, versatile disks. I mean, they basically store data by etching a 3D image uh, that is produced by, you know, the interference of two, two light streams. And, uh, but yeah, ultimately the applications consume that as zeros and ones, but that doesn't mean there hasn't been research in kind of really thinking in a revolutionary way on how to store the data. Uh, a typical HVD can store a terabyte on a, on, a, on a disk as compared to just a couple of gigabytes that we have today, uh, yeah. Blu-ray and whatnot. Then there are a bunch of other memories, PCMs, uh, resistive RAMs, um, uh, uh, CAMs, uh, content addressable memory. So I think the innovation is there, but the applications that use them, use them as zeros and ones. It's just that in a given piece, you can encode more zeros and one, ones perhaps. Yeah. And I think as time goes, as technology develops more, you'll see more of this. Uh, I mean, today we are talking so much about SSDs because they are commercialized. But some of these things I talked about memory stores earlier. I mean, some of these technologies are coming. Yeah. So it's a very interesting. interesting I, uh, so maybe, maybe in ten years we'll have a biologist or a neurobiologist on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of the technology developments tend to be evolutionary, especially today, because there's so many uh, you know researchers working in similar areas. Uh, where it becomes revolutionary is when it reaches a threshold and it changes the way people use the technology. Then suddenly you notice, you not realize that this is having a revolutionary impact. Like Flash has been around forever, but it's only just now reached a point where you could use it as kind of a substitute for HDD, and that's and that's what causes the revolution. I guess a couple, you know, kind of along the same lines. I was just thinking. So uh, you said that your mom works on, you know, disk drive heads. Mine works on holographic storage, and. I just kind of realized at the moment. Um, but this is actually kind of a very interesting thing, which is that, I mean, it seems like even though some of these technologies, like Flash is not an example, but there are several others like this, some of them not in the storage space, it seems like they become really revolutionary when they enable a new app, you know, something that you wouldn't even think about. And so, you know, the, the fact that, you know, we have kids running around using little mobile compute devices, much of that was enabled by some of these technologies, and even if they don't look, you know, revolutionary by themselves, the effort, effect that they've created, you know, in terms of what people can do and how they communicate with each other and how they sort of interact with it is, is actually quite revolutionary. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things is uh, storage is not sexy. Uh, 
because if you go to uh, schools to hire people, like most grad students, they rather go to you know a search engine company or Facebook or something. If you talk to them about storage, they say, "What is in storage?" <laughs> right? That's just. Uh, but as she, Nisha pointed out, a lot of the underlying things are you know obviously dependent on storage. Uh, exactly. Yeah, storage is what enables, but unfortunately, little kids. <laughs> I think that's a, a great quote to close our panel on that storage is not sexy. <laughs> <laughs>